Welcome back to Exegetical Tools Basic Greek Videos. In this video we're going to look at the second aorist active and middle indicative and you should have already watched the first aorist active and middle indicative video. Um, you, you may need to watch the first aorist passive video before this but not necessarily you'll be okay if you don't. So uh, the second aorist active and middle indicative there are two different types of aorist which I've already mentioned and remember that whether a verb is in the first aorist or the second aorist, it's only a matter of form. It's not a matter of meaning or, or anything like that. It just means that certain verbs like to take a certain form to express the aorist, while other verbs tend to take a, a different pattern of forms uh, to, to get into the aorist tense form. So in this case, um, we looked at, for the first aorist, we looked at luo uh, the, being the paradigm verb, and we looked at that uh, like elusa for the first singular aorist active indicative. Um, we can actually probably go back and just look at this. So you saw um, elusa down here for the final form, and then elusas and so forth. So you have the augment, um, you have the augment, the epsilon, you have um, the first aorist active tense stem, the tense form of sigma, and the alpha connecting vowel it makes it very distinctive. The tense formative sigma and the connecting vowel alpha especially helps you um, identify the first aorist. Now the second aorist is quite a bit different. Um, the second aorist is basically the same as the imperfect except it has a different stem. Okay, uh, It's the same as the imperfect active and middle but it has a different stem. So look at the similarities here. First we have the augment um, just like the imperfect. And then we're going to have the second aorist active tense stem. And we're using balo here, which means to throw or to cast. Um, and in its, its lexical form, it has two lambdas. So if you were going to turn this into um, the imperfect, you can see I've done it right here actually, a balamin. You would add the epsilon augment and then you would replace that omega with a connecting vowel and then an ending. So ebalamin is the first person plural. But for the second aorist, um, it's going to be the same except it uses a different stem. So you're still going to have this omicron epsilon connecting vowel and you're also going to use the secondary active personal endings just like with the imperfect active indicative. So um, the only way you can know the difference between an imperfect uh, and a second aorist active is to know the uh, to know the, the the stem for each one. So you need to know the lexical form because the lexical form is going to tell you that's going to be the present tense stem and therefore also the stem used for the imperfect. And that's how you know ebalamin is the imperfect because it has two lambdas. And then you'll just have to know that balo uh, its aorist stem is simply that ball with one lambda. And if you know that, whenever you come to a ballamin like this with one lambda, you'll say, ah, that's that's not the same as the lexical form. Uh, it's missing a lambda and therefore it must be the second aorist instead of the imperfect. So that's how you tell them apart. As I said, there's no difference in meaning between the first and second aorist. It's just a matter of form. It's just a matter of which pattern they want to fall into as far as morphology goes. So the aorist tense uh, stem, it's still expressing a uh, perfective aspect. It's presenting an action as a whole. It's, uh, there's not any, it's not trying to present the action as, uh, w with regard to its internal makeup or its beginning or its end or anything like that. It's just presenting the entire action as a whole. Um, and then uh, remember, the aorist tense can portray an action in the past, in the present, or the future. And... Um, it's always presented as complete action as, compo as opposed to progressive or imperfective action. So there are uh, present, uh, there are errors that are used to express present tense time events and future tense time events that can happen. Um, there, it's more usually correlated with past events because uh, the, the perfective aspect it has this sort of remoteness. It's presenting the action as if it's very remote. And so actions that are remote tend to be those actions that are in the past. Like we say, a long time ago, 
or very far away from now, something like that. Uh, we can use spatial metaphors even in English to talk about an, an event being far away from us, meaning it happened long ago, or it's in the distant future. It's, oh, that's my graduation is far away from now, something like that. Uh, would, would mean that it's not going to happen for a long time. So the spatial and the temporal um, dimensions kind of overlap, and with aspect, it's very much about that, that kind of spatial presentation of the event. So an aorist event presents, if you remember the analogy, it, it's like you're up in a hot air balloon and you're looking down and you see the whole parade. You see the whole thing and you don't really see it in action, you know, you're pretty high up. You don't see its internal makeup, you can't tell what the, the, the people are, the um, what do you call them? The things that are, can't even remember what they're called, but the things that are going by in the parade. Um, you can't see what those are, who they are. You can't read the signs. All you can see is the whole event. And it's just, you say, oh, there's a parade. You know, you see an event happening. Um, so in that sense, it's spatially remote from you, and that's partially why you're viewing it as a whole action, because it's spatially remote. So, okay, enough about aspect. Um, let's look back here at the <clears throat> the formation, a single letter. Um, we've gone over that. Uh, the second heiress tense stem is always different from the present tense stem. So with Balo right here, that you know that would never be the second heiress tense stem. It's always going to be different no matter what the verb is. And so you're always going to be able to distinguish it from the imperfect. It, it's often going to be something like the, the simplification of a double consonant like we have here follow or it'll be a vowel change and that's this one's pretty common this kind of uh, it'll have a different vowel in between the the first and the last letters of the stem and one thing to note is that I say it's a vowel change but technically the aorist uh, the aorist tense stem came first in the language and the present tense stem came later and so in that sense um, in that sense, the aorist is not really a stem change from the present, as if the present were there first and then the aorist came about, but it's that the aorist was there and then it's really a stem change to the present. But we memorize the present tense stem as the lexical form because that's just the way we do it in Greek. Um, so just remember that it's going to have a different stem. Uh, okay. And the last thing is that verbs either occur in the first or second aorist but not both except for a few verbs and that's um, that's because probably the transition of the language as it has evolved uh, so there are, there are some verbs that are kind of caught in the middle they either were a first aorist or were a second aorist and they're kind of transitioning to the the opposite and some of them even will have um, uh, what is it they'll have they'll kind of mix the the forms they'll mix the first and second aorist forms so you'll you'll get to that whenever you get to memorizing some principal parts like you can have the alpha you can have the um, the first aorist with the omicron epsilon connecting vowel rather than the alpha connecting vowel so there are some examples of that but we'll get to those verbs specifically whenever you get to um, principal parts now let's look at the actual paradigm I've droned on enough about this. Uh, the augment, epsilon, so yes, stem, connecting vowel, personal endings. So remember, this is the uh, on, s, e, omen, et, e, on. Uh, remember that son is kind of the alternate ending, and that'll show up later, but uh, not right now. So you do need to know it. But on, s, e, omen, et, e, on. So we get ebalon, ebalus, ebalin, ebalamin, ebalita, and ebalon. Okay? Uh, I guess we can say it together if you want to repeat it with me at the same time. Here we go. Ebalon, Ebalus, Ebalin, Ebalamin, Ebalita, Ebalon. Okay, and um, you can say that a few times if you want, but uh, it's more important that you memorize the endings on S, E, Omen, Et, E, On. It's the secondary active endings. You need to know those because they're reused over and over. Hopefully you know them by now. Now, the last thing to, to note is, uh, well, let me say that if you had something like lip, it would be the same thing, um, you know, elipon, etc. So it's just, just take that stem and insert it where ball is, and you'll get, this, you'll get the same result. 
um, the middle the middle form the middle form is uh, essentially the same it's just obviously in the middle but then you're gonna have secondary middle and passive personal endings like this uh, so I've chosen get on my because get on my um, get on my generally occurs in the middle and as you can see here sorry I need to space this down a little watch out for my keyboard popping up sorry about that okay so you can see the whole paradigm here Aginu, um, Aginu, Aginato, Aginamatha, Aginista, Aginonto. So you can see here, all we've changed are these different personal endings, and then this is the stem for Ginomai and the second aorist stem. It's Gen, and that'll occur very often, so you should memorize the stem Gen, or at least be able to recognize it right off the bat. It's not from Gnosko. Um, you know, Gnosko will end up looking this the aorist it kind of drops the iota but uh, again is this one here from Genomai and the aorist and um, it, it, it occurs very often so it's good to know so in this case a genomain means I became so remember the translation for a middle is something you're just gonna have to look up in uh, in a lexicon generally when you translate into English it's gonna sound like an English active verb but uh, more and more scholars today are pressing for us to to say that the middle is actually its own voice and to, to, to say that it's not equivalent to an active but that it's actually just um, there's some kind of middle nuance to it either self-interest or that the subject is a, um, a greater participant in the action than otherwise something like that but um, people have traditionally called this a deponent so I have deponent here for the sake of those who are learning traditionally but um, scholars are trying to get away from that. Um, I'll probably get away from using that terminology in the future. But for now, since it's so ingrained in, in books and grammars, it's hard not to use it uh, for people who are learning the language. So this would be I became, you became, he became, etc. Uh, so you have the middle passive endings, but the translation ends up looking active, but it's actually middle in form. So that's it. Uh, so going back up to the top, see the again see all this so this is the very important part um, these four constituent parts so the second aorist uh, you gotta remember how to distinguish these somehow I don't have a good mnemonic or anything but for the first aorist you have the um, you have the sigma alpha and then for the second aorist it, it's just you know it's like this you don't have the sigma you don't have a tense formative you just have a, a unique stem so the second aorist, you might call it the irregular aorist or something because it has a, an irregular stem. It looks different. Um, it's not necessarily true. That's probably not the best way to think about it. But um, it does have a, a stem that's different from the present tense stem, and it's going to have this Omicron Epsilon connecting vowel in the uh, secondary active endings. So if you want to memorize a form, put it in your vocab list or something like that. Uh, I would suggest Ebalon, put it in there, and then you need to note that it's not only first singular, but it's also third plural. Um, could be either. So if you wanted, you could do Ebalon and then Ebalamin or something, so you have both. But that'll help you remember second aorist active, uh, first person singular, or third person plural, indicative. All right, well, that's it for now. Um, if you haven't already, you should go on and watch the uh, aorist passive videos because. Uh, it's going to be very important. We're going to combine the first and second errors passive into one video, hopefully. All right. Thanks a lot. hope this was helpful. Leave a comment if you want, and um, see you next video.